You're listening to The Secrets of Sacred Art, where we unearth the hidden treasures, history, and deeper meanings in religious and sacred art. We're your hosts, Catherine Laffrey. And I'm Alex Murray. Welcome to Episode 18, Mass on the Hood of a Jeep. In this episode, we will explore the art and images of military field altars. Please follow The Secrets of Sacred Art in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. For a fuller experience, join us on the SQPN YouTube channel, where you can see all the images we are discussing on the show. You can find us on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, on X at SQPN, or on Instagram at Starquest Media Network. So Alex, I find it really fitting that we're recording this as we lead up to Memorial Day in the U.S. Yes. And I do remember you telling me when I was there that you guys love Jeeps over there. Good old yeah. army Jeeps. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, there's, of course, I think a lot of it is because um, World War II is such, um, is, is so woven into the psyche of the British people of course, because <laughs> they were fighting it. And um, so they, that is part of it. So you, you have a lot of like World War II reenactments and festivals and remembrances and, and, um, and that sort of thing. And, and so, of course, if ever there's a World War II festival, like the one that we have in the village here, there are always um, American Jeeps here. Yes. So they do love Jeeps and even the, wow. like the modern ones. But yeah, definitely the military ones. Well, maybe someone will watch our show and they'll do a reenactment of a mass on the hood of a Jeep. Do you That'd know be what? cool to see. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know what? When I ask, because um, obviously in the village, there are people that kind of in the know and, and they, um, they dress up. And one gentleman that I actually talked to, he owns the shop next to the bookshop where I work. And he always dresses up like a U.S. Army captain. And I thought, well, he'll know about this. He didn't know anything about it. And so he asked the guy wow. who is the, um, the coordinator for the World War II um, weekend. And he showed, I showed him a couple of the, the photographs. And do you know what? He didn't know anything about it either. So now wow. that I'm, I'm, I hope that they listen to this and maybe they'll do some research and they can add it because they... The authenticity, the effort that they go through um, on that, you know, for that weekend is incredible. And I think this would just make it even more authentic because it is it yeah. was something and is something that is part of the military. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be awesome. Yeah. I hope to, if anything like that happens, you better share. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so one important thing to tie in our Catholic faith to this, that a lot of people might not think about is as Catholics, um, there's a prayer for deliverance from an unprovided death. I remember the first time I heard that phrase, I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. And the prayer um, it goes like this. O most merciful Lord Jesus, by thine agony and bloody sweat, and by thy death deliver me, I beseech thee from a sudden and unprovided death. O gentle Lord Jesus, by thy cruel and ignominious scourging and crowning with thorns, by thy cross and most bitter passion, and by thy goodness, I humbly pray, let me not die unprepared and pass from this life without the holy sacraments. And then I was like, okay, now I get it. Yeah. We want to make sure we get that last rites, one of the yeah. sacraments, and you need a priest for that. So I feel like the most important thing about these altars that we're going to see and knowing the chaplains that were there was that they were providing at their own cost of their life and limb mm -hmm. exactly. this sacrament and throughout history of military it's been there for quite some time yeah yeah and um and it's interesting because uh well no let's go let's get started i was gonna say I'm, i could go off on a tangent but i don't want to i want to stay focused because this is a really interesting one <laughs> this is good we got a lot of beautiful stuff i to know see. We're gonna i go know, i don't, don't want to way uh, back Yes, way back. And one of the way things, back. ironically, when, when 
you you were doing this research and and I was kind of doing the the kind of the peripheral e- research. I just didn't think that um these portable altars had been around for very long and why did I think that? What a bizarre thought <laughs> is <laughs> And then cuz I was looking up, you know, my job was to kind of look up some of the really old ones. <clears throat> The oldest one uh, that we have, the oldest portable um, altar that's still in existence is, or a traveling altar, is, but you could also call it, is the traveling altar of St. Cuthbert. And this, Catherine, is actually in the um, in Durham Cathedral. And sadly, when we visited, we were not able to get into the museum, nor could oh. we see the... Um, the uh, the grave, or not, not grave, like the, the, the tomb, I should say, mm-hmm. of St. Bede, because um, the BBC was there. Do you remember? Oh, that's the right. The filming truck was there, and we were kept from being in certain parts. I know. It was oh. really annoying. But this was here. I mean, but I've seen this. But yes, yeah, so this is, in the, this is in the cathedral, and this is from the 600s. And Wow. Um, and as I said, I just never even thought about this, but of course it makes perfect sense. And, um, and I think the, the, the oldest documentation of a traveling altar would have been the tabernacle that the Israelites used when they were in <laughs> exile. So it's been around for a while, and I never even thought about it's, that. It's so funny the whole time. I was not even putting that in part of my thought going oh yeah the tabernacle god laid it out so perfectly for how to pack it up and move it along with you too as they're wandering around in the desert it's like oh yeah it is the ultimate traveling altar it is and do you know what and when i think about that think about you know pilgrimages and the crusades and and just traveling quite frankly from one place to another and you would have the missionaries of course they would have these portable altars so i have no idea where my head was in all of that (laughs) and so here are a couple of um another here's another example and this is from like between the 19th and the 19th the 9th and 12th century and it's made from ivory shell gold which is the gilding of the gold i didn't know that's what it was called did you did you know that (laughs) No, I just gold. first time I heard that term. Yes, yes. So okay. it's just like like gold powder, and um, ah, okay. And then um, and it's made out of wood. And then there's a stone inset here. And this one is this is from um, uh, the Met Museum, but it's not on display, sadly. Mm. And <clears throat> yeah, so I'm sure like there was probably a relic that went under that that um, the stone at the top. And I did and hear at, someone explain how that that stone works. Okay. And that there's actually like a carving into that stone where the yeah. relic goes and then has a little cap on it. Yes. And I think exactly. we might be able to see that in a couple of coming up slides. Okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah, because they and it has to be secure. And here, mm-hmm. um, it's interesting. I'm just looking at I want I think this the the first long side of this panel i wonder if that is uh maybe the last supper with christ washing the feet of the disciples or it's kind of hard to tell but it looks like one of those scenes where it's like multiple things happening but they put it all in one scene that's what it's it's a common thing done in sacred art and it's kind of hard to decipher unless you look at it long enough and know what to see yeah, yeah. And well this is what I was looking at. So the kind of at the far right hand um mm-hmm. of the of the box that looks like could that be the washing of the feet or is this someone being healed by Christ? Um it's and yeah. and I think the one in the middle I'm I'm going to say the middle seated figure is is would be Christ or um, perhaps they're missionaries taking uh, the gospel to some people because on the far mm-hmm. left, you've got obviously um, two figures, you know, walking and one is holding mm-hmm. a cross and everyone is holding their hands up almost in greeting. And he has his hand kind of raised 
and in blessing. So that's kind of yeah. infor- I I couldn't find any information on the on the the front of the box, but the two um, side panels of the box, uh, I was able to kind of figure these these two out, and I think it's um, if you look at the the one to the left and it's kind of a little higher up. It, mm-hmm. it is a priest, and, yeah. um, and you can see that he has the chalice in one hand, and I think it's in one hand, or it could even be, I was actually thinking about this, is, there's, is this kind of a story of something maybe miraculous that was happening? Because I don't actually see him holding this chalice, but the chalice is elevated, almost as if it's elevated on its own. So and that's it almost looks like it's wrapped with the cloth that's across his body there. Exactly. So that's why I was saying, so you don't see his, um, his hand, but you do see, um, yeah, this elevated chalice. So it could be, you know, he could be mm-hmm. like, you know, when, when priests elevate the um, monstrance, when it mm-hmm. has the Eucharist in it, they, they, you know, they cover up their hands out of reverence to reference reverence to the to our lord um mm-hmm. but also if you look very kind of next to his um torso you have three consecrated hosts and they look just like the consecrated hosts that you'd have today and we did do mm-hmm. an episode on that you could go back and look at um the art of uh communion bread and and how mm-hmm. it's consistent but this Ninth or twelfth century uh, traveling altar. You know, when you're looking at it, if you know what con- what what communion bread looks like, you'd know exactly what what's going on there. And yeah. the second image, um, this is on the opposite end of the the two short sides of this traveling altar, and I just love this. Um, it's beautiful. Each, it is, and it is an image of the Good Shepherd. And we just had Good Shepherd Sunday, and. Mm. This just speaks volumes of the priests who would take these traveling altars wherever they needed to go. Um, they're good shepherds, and they're looking after the sheep. And I, I, I really, um, I find this quite a touching um, image. And also you can see the hand of God the Father coming out of heaven mm-hmm. and kind of um, blessing the Son, the good shepherd. And it looks yeah. so, you can also see. I have the, to giggle um, just a little though. The way the hand is reaching out and the little sheep right there. Yeah. My my daughter, whenever she sees a puppy or some cute little animal, just wants to like boop it on the nose. So. There you go. Like this. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, everyone. That was a little phrase that went through my mind. It's like God just wants to boop that little lamb on the nose. So there you go. It's good to yeah. bring home the lost sheep. <laughs> It is absolutely, absolutely, and I, do you know, the other thing that struck me about this was how um, I know some people. I don't know if it's even a debate anymore, but because of iconoclasm or the heresy of iconoclasm that happened in the early church, a lot of images were destroyed, and so there's a question: you know, in were they carving um, icons? You know, they were definitely painting mm-hmm. them but were they carving them and were there statues? And, and I, I don't know how much of a debate that is anymore, but when you look at the carvings of this, and I, I know it's from the ninth, ninth to 12th century, but there, mm-hmm. it does have a lot of a, it has an iconographic feel to it, especially the oh, one yeah. of the Good Shepherd, don't you? you know, just the draping of the clothes and the hands and, and, um, you know, I would say the proportions of the body, but I'm, I'm not quite sure because the priest in mm-hmm. the other one, his head looks kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> really small. He must have been unusually tall. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. But um, yeah, so this is, um, yeah. oh, and here we go. So this is another portable altar from the past. And this is really beautiful. And this is the life, scenes from the life of Jesus. And it is German. And it's about the, it's, it was made between 1160 and 1180. And around it, it has letters, or sorry, words. Some of them are abbreviated. I sat and tried to, I mean, obviously, this mm-hmm. is the thing. You can look at the pictures and know um, what's going on. 
But then you can look at the Latin and kind of practice your Latin a little bit, mm-hmm. which is nice. So, uh, but you don't need to know Latin to know what's going on. And at the bottom left-hand corner, I th- and I think this looks like it's probably cloisonne or enamel or something. Um, yeah, the enamel work is gorgeous on this. It really it is. is. Yeah, Beautiful. yeah. And and just the hand, the just the detailed metal work. I love the um, the enunciation the enunciation at the bottom left hand uh, corner, mm-hmm. and and just above it is what I would call the heroine of hell, where where um, Christ goes down into hell and he's lifting up. Do you know who were the first people to come out of hell when when Adam Christ- and Eve. That's right. And so I was like, that must be Adam and Eve. And, and, um, and the devil looks quite um, shocked at what has happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like he's mm-hmm. even pulling, he's pulling on the arm of one of them. Look at, and he's got, oh, his, yeah, he's his, trying to fight back. His, he is with both of them. And, um, and Christ is, is, you know, that was, have, have you ever heard of it? It's like the greatest joke was, um, uh, was played on the devil because uh, Christ on the cross completely fooled him. Thought he, oh, you mm-hmm. know, he's dead. And then, mm-hmm. <laughs> then knocking at your door and pulling everybody out. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, what about a couple of other? Can you identify a couple more scenes here? Catherine? What I really was kind of sad about is the nativity. Mm-hmm. Looks like the only damaged image, and we've lost. Our Lady reclining in whatever yes. happened to this piece. So we could be. And then next to that yeah. looks like uh, we have the uh, uh, pre- presentation yes. at the yeah. temple. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have uh, obviously the flight to Egypt. And, flight to um, Egypt, yeah. And then coming down again on the right hand side, the middle right hand one, that would be the uh, slaughter of the innocents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then you have the um, epiphany on the bottom left, which I think the juxtaposition of of them is really interesting as well. So you've got Mm -hmm. one, you know, on the opposite end, you have the the Annunciation and the Epiphany kind of mirroring each other. And I'm not sure about these other two. So we do, oh, I know what it is. I've answered my question. So you have um, people laying down palm leaves as Christ yeah, enters into Jerusalem. Sun. And yeah. then I think that little castle there is probably where Pontius Pilate is to make his judgment. Uh, okay. That's what I think. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I couldn't get any dimensions on this one, but this one probably looks like it was going to, it was probably not I very the same big. size as the last one that we saw. Yeah, I don't know if I have a, I don't know if I have the, Measurements and the way that, that it has you know. that that space for the stone in the middle. Exactly. But again, beautiful exactly. work on this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I don't know if this one is on. I, I couldn't see whether or not that. I don't think this one is on display either, which is kind of sad. Yeah. But, you know. Oh, yeah. If you're not going to display it, maybe, maybe a church could use it. <laughs> yeah. But we're gonna we're gonna fast forward in time yes. a little bit here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a um, wonderful um, army history has a nice section on the chaplains, and um, there's also another website called thechaplainkit.com that's basically an online museum. Fascinating. Okay. And I loved how one of the first things they presented was the origin of the word chaplain. So I guess we're still hanging back in time here. Yeah. And, you know, and they, they at the Army History website made it a great point of saying and, and talking about this, that as long as armies has, have existed, military chaplain, chaplains have served alongside soldiers providing for their spiritual needs, working to improve morale and aiding the wounded. And the Bible tells the early Israelites bringing their priests into battle with them. Uh, pagan priests had accompanied um, Roman legions on their conquest. 
And when Christianity became the dominant religion in Rome, then we had Christian chaplains um, administering to the Roman soldiers. So you can see how it's it's been there. Like you said, Alex, since yeah. the tabernacle, there's been traveling. And they're also called field altars out in the field. And so um, in the U.S. Army Chaplain Museum, when they were talking about um, St. Martin of Tours, and that um, because of him using his cloak to share, so a piece of his cape or kappa in Latin, shared it with the beggar. He had the dream about Christ appearing. And then from that dream, you know, it led to his growth as a Christian and, you know, ended up serving as, I believe, a bishop even. Mm. And so St. Martin's cape became an object of veneration. Catholics, we love our relics. Yes, we do. And it used to be carried into battle by French kings because he's the patron saint of France. And its portable shrine was called a capella. And its caretaker was called a capellinus. And this eventually derives down through French and into English to chaplains. So there you go. thanks to his kindness, we have chaplains. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So sorry. Um, so it's moving forward. We're going to jump way forward now. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're going to... Time and space. Uh, <laughs> time and space. We're jumping forward here. So um, this photograph in the upper left corner, black and white photograph with the tent, making me feel like those, you know, tents of the tabernacle and the Israelites, right? Yeah, yeah. We have um, a Sunday morning mass in the camp of the 69th... Um, New York State Militia. And it's the first known photograph of services in the U.S. Army. So this is oh, the wow. first photograph we have of this happening this during the Civil War. And this is um, Father Thomas Mooney. And he's the chaplain of the Infantry Regiment of the New York State Militia. And the Irish American soldiers were there for Catholic Mass at Fort uh, Cochrane. Wow. So this Beautiful is in 1861. On. Yeah, I, I mean. Know, that's so amazing. You can see that today. That's what priests were today. Mm-hmm. also found it fascinating, too, to look at the 1880s insignia. Now, also in the Civil War, they even had Jewish chaplains available. Oh, wow. So, um, but you have... Here is um, the shepherd's crook, like you were just talking about on the side of that one um, yeah, yeah. portable altar, the good, shepherd. the good shepherd, and the shepherd's crook was one of the first or early insignia used by the army chaplains, and then also the ten tablet of the Ten Commandments for the Jewish chaplains is the other yeah. insignia there. And I love how they incorporated all of this into... Um, their current seal. Yeah, yeah. So you have the little shepherd's crook at the top. You have the Holy Spirit coming down and um, the open book, which can also give you that Ten Commandments tablet sort of feel. And yeah. then uh, you want to give the Latin a try on that one, Alex? <laughs> for God and country. Yeah, for God and yeah. country. Yeah, I and also you've one. got the palm leaves at the top, and mm -hmm. then it looks like little crown, you know, thorns from the crown of thorns. So that's really oh yeah, uh, I hadn't picked yeah. that up before. There you go. Yeah, really nice. And then jumping forward in time again. Yeah, so this is from World War One, and this is Bel this is in Belgium or Belgium, the Belgian Army Chapel truck, and. What's interesting about this is the company who made this 
uh, chapel truck is called Renault, and it's still around, and you can see their cars driving all over the place. I had sh- This is the image that I had shown to uh, the gentleman who does the World War II reenactment. He'd never seen anything like this before, and he was absolutely fascinated by it. Um, yeah. Couldn't find any information about it. Except this, you know, uh, if right. anybody has any information, we would love to hear it. Um, please do share it with us. I think what I'm going to do, so we live in the Midlands and um, there is a good bit of car manufacturing in this area. And there are two car museums not far from here. And I ah. think it's going to be worth, and I know my husband is going to, I'm not going to exactly have to twist his arm <laughs> to go because I'm they've got to have something like this so what I'm going to do is I'm when I go to the museum I'm going to take this picture and go tell me some information about this and uh, so they've always been here and this is so innovative back in Mm -hmm. um, 1916 you know you can they were really thinking the level of importance to bring the soldiers their spiritual food was Mm -hmm. was a high priority and look how they have I love how the even top. the tires are the same color as the truck. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Those are like whitewash. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like the you know in the, the, the Disney film cars, remember when they had the little Pope mobile? <laughs> kind of yes. Like this. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but you were saying what's across the top? No, I was just saying if you look at the top, there's a there's even a cross. It's like a Celtic cross. On the top of the mm-hmm. um, of the of the vehicle, but it looks like everything would be packed away, and then they would just bring these altars out and around, so the truck would actually be hidden behind it, and um, mm-hmm. and then you would just have the altar there. It's really fascinating, really fascinating. I'm so sad I couldn't find a better picture. Yeah, of the work that it unfolds and surrounds the opening to the truck. Because know, there's beautiful paintings on there. And I believe this well, one know, was dedicated to St. Elizabeth. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, and you know, if it's Bel- Belgian at this time, yeah, they would have made sure it was really lovely. Because, of course, oh. you know, the Flemish uh, painters, you know, they, they have a long tradition of beautiful, beautiful artwork. But, uh, yeah, it was um, sadly not a whole lot of information, as I said about it, but but definitely a lot of determination. One of the things I, I, I wanted to mention, since we're concentrating a little bit on uh, this image from World War I, um, mm-hmm. I was listening to the British Catholic um, historian, Joanna Bogle. This was years ago. And she was talking about um, a number of English soldiers converted to Catholicism during World War I or shortly after they Mm -hmm. came home. And one of the reasons was, um, and this isn't any, this is not a criticism to the um, Church of England ministers who were there, because of course they were there with the troops as well. And it's not a criticism to them, but you know, World War I was an incredibly uh, bloody war because you had kind of new technology coming along with no. old fighting tactics. It was the same in the American world, uh, Civil War. You know, they, yep. they were coming up with these new weapons, but old methods of fighting. And so the, the carnage was just off the scale. So it was the same during World War I in the trenches. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things that inspired the soldiers were seeing how the Catholic priests would just nothing stopped them from going in and giving soldiers the last rites or comforting them somehow. A lot of these, um, I a lot of the the Catholic priests were Irish and they were used to. Uh, they had seen a lot of horror. This sounds terrible, but it's true. They had seen a lot of horror um, in their home country. And so mm-hmm. they weren't, and, and the poor um, C of E chaplains were quite, sometimes they were just, they were shell-shocked like everybody else. They just, and they couldn't 
function as well. Whereas these Irish priests would just go in and, you know, whatever the situation, however, you know, the blood and the mud and the screaming and the pain and nothing stopped them. And that made such an impact on the um, English soldiers that a lot of them converted. Did you know that? Wow. No, I did yeah. not know that. Actually, yeah. my great grandfather was uh, and earned his U.S. citizenship by enlisting into World War One. Oh wow! Earned the uh, French Cross for gallantry or bravery, or because he was in trench warfare and just was like, even though he was wounded, he refused to leave until he could help more people. And finally, his officer said, "That's it, enough." Good job. Wow. Move on. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, yeah. Donald's, I think it was his great grandfather. My, weirdly, my grandfather was in World War I, but that's another story. <laughs> wow. But, um, <laughs> no, uh, my husband's uh, great grandfather, or maybe grand, must have been great grandfather, uh, he was in a Scottish regiment and they had gone into the trenches wearing their um, uh, kilts. And they found uh-huh. out very shortly that um, lice and fleas liked kilts, so they switched to trousers. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what we have a dirty business, yeah. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. A anyway, dirty business, and yet look at how beautiful some of these portable altars in World War One could be. Yeah. So yeah, um, we have two different ones, but of the same style, almost the, probably the same make. Um. The one to the upper left is uh, has a three panel beautiful painting and was carried like a briefcase and it belonged to and was used by Father George R. Metcalf from St. Paul, Minnesota, who happened to serve as chaplain to General George S. Patton during World War II. But they believe that this portable altar actually came from world war one it had yeah. been like continuing in use yeah well i mean yeah there's, there's such an effort to put them together and the mm-hmm. function is always the same it's not like you it's not like a machine gun and oh let's let's upgrade this i mean the altar is the altar is the altar yeah <laughs> yeah so they it's interesting the it. father's uh case seems to have been missing its top because as you can see in the other version which um oh yeah i believe did you find this one alex this is from uh it looks very similar to one that i found but not quite i mean i think there obviously there there's a um you know there's a template here of what they're using yeah. but cuz i have here this is from padre is it balmer of the balmer yeah yeah what was that? The okay. eighth? What's the BN? Uh, British. I don't know. Be British Navy. I don't know. In uh, the Norfolk Regiment. Regiment. Yeah, yeah, maybe. So. Of course. Oh my gosh, my husband would be like, "You don't know." Uh oh. <laughs> I know. Get checked oh, on that one. I know. Oh but gosh, my, my nephew's in the military as well. Oh, sorry. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> what I love though are the tiny little. You know, tools of the trade, the, the candlesticks are beautifully done. The cruets for the water and wine, mm-hmm. beautifully done. There's all kinds of little details. And then just, I love storage boxes, okay? So I think yeah. that's why I'm <laughs> fascinated by these things. The way everything has a place for it, but, you know, still very beautiful. Yeah. Not only a place, yeah. but a place, you know, where it's going to survive, you know, really getting banged up. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you have to like throw everything in there and 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 run. I don't know. Yeah. And I find the panel, the painted panel, is quite interesting. You have um, Mary and the Christ Child in the middle, and then on one side of her, to the right in the brown, is a soldier who seems like he's mm-hmm. dressed from World War One. Yes. And then the other side, it's hard to make out. I don't know if he's just supposed to be. I, I think maybe just like a, I was a thinking regular person. The na- no, I was thinking somebody from the Navy. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Then yeah, you have the knight in shining armor. 
Well, I'm going to say that's probably a saint. So we've got, it looks like, I want to say, oh gosh, well, St. Michael, of course. And on on one end, and I'm not quite sure. Mm-hmm. It's hard to tell because it's so far away. It could be, yep. do you know what? Maybe it's St. Martin of Tours. Oh, it could be. I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm just going to guess. Okay, so I think that the the image on the far right hand side of this uh, World War I altar, I think that might be St. Michael, of course. And then on the opposite end, um, on the left hand side, I am just going to say, I don't know why I want to say it's St. Martin of Tours, but that's who I think it might be. Mm. Just given the context, and um, it's really hard Possibly to tell. Possibly St. George? It could be St. George. Yeah, yeah. Although he He's another military one, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely is. These angels almost look like fairies, though, don't they? Down at the feet of the Blessed Mother. It's, I think this mm-hmm. is part of the, um, just the aesthetics of the time. Is It's a little, yeah. you know, like coming out of the Victorian era and, and a little bit sentimental for me. I don't know how I'd feel, but it doesn't matter yeah. how I feel. It's got, it has all the right rubrics. <laughs> yep, yep. So, all right, let's see what else know, we find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't, we don't want the Navy to feel left out here, so. No, no. No, this is a beautiful um, Navy set in the box, and they, um, Army sets will sometimes have a maroon velvet and drapery that comes with them. The Navy sets have this, um, Beautiful blue color. Yeah. Navy blue, yeah. yeah. Or royal blue, even. How appropriate is that? All right, very liturgical setting. Again, the way that everything is packaged so yeah. perfectly. It's like nice, you know, good military precision on that. Yeah. And then um, the uh, mass that's being said uh, is actually on the way to Iwo Jima. And the men are from the 4th Marine Division. And the smaller image there on the big gunship is U.S. Navy. Um, that is Chaplain Linder on the USS South Dakota. That's on June 19 of 1944. So the U.S. Um, Navy chaplain kits were also slightly larger than the Army kits. Um, I'm guessing that? probably because um, the Army ones got to be carried around, so they got to be a little lighter weight. The Navy ones generally are on the ship, and okay. so yeah, not as much transport had, necessary. Well, I was just thinking maybe it was like a little bit bigger. Maybe it had some kind of it was able to float. <laughs> You know, like if it fell overboard, it wouldn't <laughs> sink. It would just, you could catch it because oh. it had like extra, um, what do you call, you know, but a buoyancy or something. Yeah. Maybe not. Oh, there's some good stories coming up about uh, chaplain kits ending up in a river. So we'll get to that a little okay. later. Okay, yeah. yeah. But I have to say that that smaller picture on the battleship is also part of the reason why we're doing this show. A while ago, I had seen this image and a couple others, and I was just obsessed with these beautifully painted triptychs that went with some of these traveling altars and wanted to know more about them. So we're going to see some beautiful painted ones. Yeah, um, yeah. A little bit later on. So next. This one. um now, is this you or me? I think this is you. Cool. This is me. Thank you. <laughs> no, so this is another. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I think, uh, did I find, I think I found this one, or maybe you did. But um, this is another uh, priest celebrating, uh, Father C.V. Murphy. Um, and he is uh, celebrating Mass in a Dutch field on the front line. And this was taken by Sergeant Mappen. Um, and this is from the Impor- Imperial War Museum, which is in London, or at least one of them is in London. And again, and this is, I, I, this looks like an American Jeep. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you see how it's it's not quite as um, when you contrast it with the World War One uh, chaplain jeep, it's not quite as elaborate, is it? But you know, no. times have changed, and war was getting um, increasingly. I mean, it's always been bloody, but mm-hmm. on a much larger scale. You know, after the Great War, no. the war to end all wars. Then you're in the second one, huh? <laughs> Yeah, but, um, this image reminds me of Monuments Men. Yes. Remember they were driving yeah. around in a canvas-covered truck like this? Yeah, so it yeah. Just made me, yeah. Do you know, I was just thinking about that. I'm kind of surprised at the austerity of this this particular one because I guess in a way, I you know, there could have been something on, on the... On the um, I'm surprised they didn't have some kind of decoration or something on the cloth, but mm-hmm. you know, needs must, I suppose. Yeah. But, yeah. This, so this one. one. Yeah. So this was really fascinating. I found this one um, on. Uh, excuse me. I found this one on um, an Australian diocese website. Because this particular um, military altar is being refurbished and restored. Um, I think it's going to be used as a museum piece. But mm-hmm. this was used in the Boer War, um, World War One, and World War Two, And uh, for the um, Australian inf- infantry. And the priest was called Father Edward O'Sullivan... Going, going, Goidanich, MC, chaplain for uh, fourth class captain, sixth infantry brigade, brigade at the second Australian division, and he celebrated um, mass with this altar at Gallipoli, if you can believe, it, and he survived, which is oh wow, I know, I know, I was really kind of taken aback by that, and again, it's very. Um, very austere. It looks a bit clunky. Like this looks like it would be heavy to to carry around. And apparently, he had just finished celebrating mass, and um, some artillery artillery came and nearly hit him. It just missed him, like miraculously. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and and. So this is seen again, you know, it was it has been in several different conflicts because the altar is the altar is the altar. You don't need to upgrade it. Maybe now, mm-hmm. you know, maybe the packaging could be something that's a little more shockproof, a little bit lighter mm-hmm. than wood, something that could protect everything and not be so heavy to carry around, but the essentials inside don't change. So they could yeah. use them in various ones. But this was really we have we have the links in the show notes. Um, and just to read about his life was, was really fascinating, really fascinating. I love the use of the uh, almost chandelier light candle stands. Yeah, like little sconces. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they swing yeah. out. Mm-hmm. If you see what I mean, like you take the candle off and then it probably would, the hinge probably kind of swings in and when it swings in it goes down so it can be stored so it's like locked in there mm-hmm. and then there you can see the halter stone in the center yeah 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 and so you can almost see the little square in the middle you can and do, that's, yeah. yeah so that would be where the relic would be is under that little square yeah exactly exactly yeah Very it's incredible nice. that, yeah just the, the Again, I'm taking, but I'm, I'm always quite moved. I've, uh, well, I've always had a heart for priests. I just think I, I'm just so grateful to God for them. But then when you look at this sort of thing, I'm, I'm quite moved at, at uh, the efforts that they'll go to, to, uh, mm-hmm. to be the good shepherd. Yeah. Then you found in these cases. Yes, wow. Was, yes. Yes, so I found this one. Um, the one on the left is a traveling altar, and this was used by British Benedictine monks. And again, we have the um, the links in the show notes to get a little more details of it. But this one um, also had seen several different uh, conflicts 
And um, I hadn't appreciated the role of the Benedictines in um, the British military, but they've been, I guess I always just thought of them as being more cloistered, but now they go out. And Mm -hmm. um, this brings up a good question. Do you know, um, in the U.S. military, my husband and I were talking about this, do the chaplains have a rank are they are they considered a part of the military or do they is it like a totally separate thing and also can they carry weapons do you know so again i highly recommend going to the chaplain kit website which will be okay. in our show notes they go into great detail about how and when the chaplains started to become more part of the military. They actually have a chaplain school that they have to attend before they can serve. And they do have rank. And they also, um, they actually had the whole thing set up that, yeah, the chaplain should be paid too, not just Mm. volunteering himself. So, Yeah. um, (laughs) yeah, so there's a great history of how the chaplaincy was worked into the military. And so, again, fascinating read. We have spent hours. I know Alex and I have just yeah. <laughs> you know, going down one rabbit hole after another. We can't hit exactly. it all in our showtime, but please, people, you know, go, go look for these things. They're fabulous. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, but, and I do know that the, how the, the, or at least it's at one point, the, the ranks or, or the position of the, of the chaplain in the U.S. military was different from what it is in the um, British military. And um, they do come in, I believe, as um, an officer. Chaplains Mm -hmm. do. And I believe it's the rank of captain, which would have been Mm -hmm. consistent with the Australian one. It was a a part of the Commonwealth and still part of the Commonwealth. And so the the, um, traveling altar on the right here is from World War II, and this is from the Commonwealth. I don't know, you know, that could be anywhere. That could be Canadian, you know, it could be Canada, Australia, South Africa, you know, you name it. But this was part of um, the British military and uh, one of their Commonwealth countries. I, I chose this image because I thought the rose depicted on it mm-hmm. in that blue field was beautiful. Yes. I just think, yeah. I don't I also know what found that the- would have. I think it's a pix, the little yes, yeah, cylinder, yeah. very beautiful yeah. and simply done. Has a nice cross carved into the top of it. Yeah, kind of reminiscent of the host itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can see yeah. a slight change in the style of the cruets from the previous one from World War One, where they had a little foot yeah. to them. These are a little more, you know, simplified, wider based. Yeah. Yeah, probably for all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Stability yeah. and, and everything. And then one thing I had wondered was, what do the Orthodox get? Because yeah. their kit would have to be a little bit different. So here is a picture of, um, I think it is possibly the first authorized Orthodox kit. So, no. Um, the one that's in the red frame there. Yeah. And then you can see actually the other ic- uh, picture is um, from about the mid 70s or so when it was first used. And then they okay. have a nice little mini iconostasis, all their little icons set up on the altar there. So a few extra things with the. Yeah. Um, Probably makes it a little heavier. <laughs> yeah, a little heavier. Yes, yes, yes. So you have the thurible for the incense and yeah. a few extra things. But beautifully done. What was really neat to find out is that a lot of these kits have um, been, you know, like, like an original one would be issued to an Orthodox chaplain. And when that chaplain would retire he would hand it on to the new chaplain. So there's a possibility that the one in this photo, or maybe one like it, had been handed down through three chaplains. Nice. So it just kind of kept 
being used. So like we saw some of those World War One yeah, that were probably course. used for World War Two. So when yeah. it's beautifully and and done well, it can be used on and on again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because yeah. you're gonna need the same yeah. Yeah. You're gonna need the same thing no matter when you celebrate the divine liturgy or the mass. Yeah. Yep. And then earlier you had mentioned about the Israelites traveling with the, the tabernacle and I was yeah. so pleased to find um this image. This is of um uh Max uh Fuchs at is it Aachen? Yes. Aachen, yeah. Aachen. Aachen, yeah. So uh this was October twenty ninth, nineteen forty four, and he's there with another uh, a Jewish chaplain. He himself wasn't a chaplain, but he was kind of like an acting chaplain for his little group. And he said, oh, I was a cantor for um, services in his community. And so he had the priest that was there with this group as they were coming into Germany say, gather up all the men. We need to do a service right now. And so they gathered all the Jewish men and everybody that was there, whether they were Jewish or not, was part in on all of this. This was the yeah. first broadcasted Jewish service in Germany since the rise of Hitler. Wow. And wow. Um, so and we're actually going to It was the Catholic priest who rounded everybody up saying we're going to yeah, do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 And then that's like an example there on the side of a um, Jewish chaplain's kit. Beautifully done. You can see they're yeah. using the same base as the other ones and then just adding in the elements that they need. But what I want everybody to enjoy right now is to actually listen to Max cantering this service. France, we were, we were almost close to the German border already in Aachen. So he said to me, the Catholic chaplain says, get all the men together, all the Jewish men in the division. Now the picture that you see, it was right, what they call the Siegfried line. They were called the dragon's teeth. They were anti-tank obstacles. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. If you heard the broadcast, you can hear artillery shells coming over us and all that. There was still fighting, there was fighting going on there. They weren't exactly in, on territory where it was 100% safe, you know. So in a way, you, you felt elated, you know, that all this, this is happening and with the, the service and everything else. But again, then again, there was a certain amount of fear also. Now, Rabbi Lefkowitz was a corps chaplain. He was not a division chaplain, since we didn't have a division chaplain. Now, I was like the acting chaplain there. So he made all the speeches and everything, and I did all the singing. I would say, I mean, the emotion was uh, tremendous. It was unbelievable. I mean, all these, all the soldiers there, they, they themselves couldn't believe it, you know, because of everything that they heard, all the atrocities that we all knew what was happening, you know. I can't describe it. It's really, it's indescribable, you know, the way. How how you really felt, you know, and, 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 as a Jewish soldier, you know, and, and especially after most of them had family that perished in the Holocaust, you know, there were so many of. I mean, I myself, I sometimes I come to tears, you know, and I fear that we had so many uh, of my family. So the, the atmosphere there was, was, was unbelievable, you know, to have a, a first service, you know, and on German soil, you know. It's difficult really to describe it, what you felt in your heart, you know. They felt the Jewishness in their heart. 
That's really, I think, what everyone felt, you know. You, you felt so elated, you know. So what do you think, Alex? Was that beautiful? <laughs> it was quite um, moving. Do you know, I just, uh, I have, I, my beloved Auntie Pearl was Jewish, and um, not a whole lot of her family survived World War II. And so I have always had uh, a, a lot of space in my heart for, um, as St. John Paul II called it, our, our elder brothers in the faith, I, I just find it to be extraordinary. And yes, it is very moving. Um, we'd love to hear people's feedback on that. And what an extraordinary moment that must have been for them, you know, on yeah. so many different levels. I cannot imagine in the midst of all of that horror of war mm-hmm. to hear those um, to hear that cantering and again to hear the mass in you know yeah. just to have that peace of God in the midst of war must have been beyond a comfort it's not just a comfort it's it's um it's kind of like you know when I'm, and trust me this is not trivializing any of it because of how much I love uh, Tolkien's writings and and hopefully if anybody listens to uh, the secrets of Middle Earth, you can tell I kind of spend a lot of time in Middle Earth. <laughs> but um, it's kind of like when when Frodo and Sam, everything was taken away from them, and all they had to keep them going was Limbus. And uh, you know, I think I would imagine that some of these soldiers in some really dark days that the uh, the Eucharist probably carried them through in ways that they had not imagined, no doubt. And it's mm-hmm. the same thing with, uh, with uh, these Jewish soldiers. I just can't imagine how powerful that must have been. What a victory. Thanks be to mm-hmm. God. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of sacred art, including Thomas W., Tim W., Marion M., George U. and Amy M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Sacred Art and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by, by visiting sqpn.com slash give. All right. We have a few more beautiful pieces to look at here. Yes. And again, this goes back to that Navy ship that we saw where there's a beautiful triptych that was being used in the service. And there's a woman by the name of Violet Oakley, who is commissioned to do several of these traveling altar pieces. Uh, she's an American artist. She was the first American woman to receive a public mural commission. Mm. Uh, the style of her illustrations and stained glass reflect her love of English pre raphaelites Alex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we're going to have to do a whole show on them one day because there's a, yeah. lots of interesting secrets about them. <laughs> yes. Yes. And Violet was raised in the Episcopal Church and um, was also uh, later on a uh, student of Christian science. So okay. she has an interesting background. So it kind of reflects a little bit in the style of her work. Um. This is a closed triptych. And so on these outer doors, it says that it was commissioned um, by a citizens group. And a lot of the altars that were used, the traveling field altars, yeah. um, there were ways for citizens to provide for them. So linens to be donated or just to okay, send nice. in money to help pay for the, the, uh, the, all the, boxes and everything themselves so all the little yeah. details that have to go into it and you think about you know if if you're someone on the home front and knowing that your soldiers out there and needing to have spiritual care you're going to want to contribute in some way so it's Absolutely. neat to see that these citizen yeah. committees would be part of this so the, no, this altar was used question. yeah sorry is this was this made out was this wood or is this like um a, like a like a cardboard or, or poster board or something. What was this? What metal. Was she painting? Metal. Well, wow. She was painting on metal. Interesting. So this is old. 
oil on metal. So, you know, they're definitely durable. They're yeah, made to yeah. last. I found it interesting. I zoomed in purposely on the, the one section on the right-hand uh, mm -hmm. panel there. And I was so confused going, what is up with this dolphin and the letters around it? And what it's supposed to be is the, the fish symbol. Yeah, yeah. All the way back to ancient Christian times where they would know each other by drawing a little arc in the sand, and then the other person would complete the arc to make the yeah. fish. The letters in the Greek word for fish are a little abbreviation for, um, how's it go, Alex? You remember? Oh, it's I know. I don't. <laughs> like something about me. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Something Golly, like you guys that, are going to sure. yell at me, aren't you? Go ahead, give it to me just, on Discord, you know people. <laughs> I was going to say, just put it, just do it in a, a nice comment on the YouTube comment section. That's all. Nope, nice comment. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the other side with the Alpha Omega over the boat reminded me of some of the uh, eliminations we saw of, uh, was it Cuthbert and some others? They're traveling on the waters. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The inside of this, though. Wow. And this is, again, on metal. This is all metal. On metal. So, oil wow. on metal. So, here you have Christ walking on the water, pulling up Peter. Look at the way the ship is being tossed in the background behind yeah. and the seagulls. It's, this is a beautiful version. It is. Of a lesson to Christ us all. and Peter. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I loved how she did nice little lettering and things around uh, yeah. the edges and she put uh, little inset pictures also. And also see she's kind of um, spread out the scene um, on the two um, far panels. So on the on the left hand one you kind of have almost like a just the highlighted, it's beautifully done where it's, you know, the dark uh, background mm -hmm. and just the, the ship itself is like highlighted ever so subtly with um, like a gold yellow paint. And then on the mm -hmm. other side, the right hand side, um, you have Christ walking on the water. But again, it's 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 almost like a um, this ethereal kind of. I don't want to say it's like a photo negative because that's not what it looks like. It looks like something right. ethereal, something otherworldly. Yeah, really beautiful. And I love the expression on Peter's face. It's almost like. You know, that surprise moment of, yeah, help me. <laughs> exactly. It's almost like he's got, it's almost like the, um, the waves are solid, you know, like his, his mm -hmm. arm is like resting, like it's almost like on a, like on a bed or something. But, yeah, uh, like he's uh, climbing up. The other thing I think is interesting is Christ is not bearded. He's clean shaven. I wonder, is that like a reference to the military? Everybody's got to be clean shaven. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's. I wondered that too. I wondered if it wasn't part of. Um, I believe at this time period, um, among different denominations, there was the question of whether or not Christ had a beard, oh, and oh. some of it was because of um, a resurgence of interest in the Holy Land and different yeah. places, and also seeing uh, what they would call the beardless Christ in the catacombs. Yes. Yeah, of course. But maybe like disconnecting that from, you know, different Roman traditions and just assuming, well, he had no beard. I remember reading a book written about the same time that actually had that debate in it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously there are, and we'll be talking about some beardless images of Christ, but it's the first, it's a modern one I've not seen before. Yeah. So here we have another one of her triptychs. This is um, the Angel of Victory triptych. Yeah. And again, this one is actually on wood panels instead of on metal panels. And um, yeah, so this panel, you have this victory angel in the middle. I love how they have all the soldiers down around the angel's feet. Those are pilots. Those are. Oh, pilots. Yes. Pilots. Yes. Yes. Or Navy pilots, Thank but you. those are pilots. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just, my, and, my father-in-law flew yeah. <laughs> bomber plane. I know pilot. Hey, they could be one. marine pilots too. They so. could be, but whatever, they're flying, mm -hmm. whatever, whoever it is, they're flying planes. And look, of course, look in the background, Catherine, look at all the planes. The oh, now I see them. I thought that was just part of the clouds. 
Uh, see, that's what's so fascinating about these. You really look at them and you see more stuff every you time. See more and more and more. Yeah. 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 And look at how the St. Michael to the left here has those fiery red r wings like we saw yeah. in the one for Patton. Yeah. And then this is definitely St. George on this on the right absolutely, side. Absolutely. Absolutely. And those are the two that. saddest dragons in the whole wide world. <laughs> Well, they're dead. <laughs> I guess I don't know. They they, they kind of look cute, and I don't. I always think, oh, okay, okay, you're gonna kind of have the defeated dragon. He can't look cute. No sympathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, another one of her triptychs. Wow. Yes, wow. a lot of little detail to see in this. Yeah. So you have the Madonna of the Seas. Um, this one. Definitely traveled because um, in its citation notice, it says that it was at one time at the St. Albans U.S. Naval Hospital in New York. It was also on the USS Leedstown, the USS Baltimore, and oh, wow. the USS um, Currituck. Wow. So it did some traveling. This is a well-traveled altarpiece. Yeah. And, you know, and look at the... the um Submarine uh, scopes. Is that what that is? Coming out of the water? And also ships. Yeah. Those aren't just submarine scopes. There's some uh, ships that were very narrow based with tall antenna. Okay. Maybe that's what it is instead. Yeah. 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 But they just keep fading into the background. Yeah. Yeah. I love the ray of sunlight at Mary's um, foot that's pointing down to the water where it looks yes. like a cross. It does. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how you have on the left, you have angels that look like they're almost sorrowful. And then mm -hmm. the ones on the right are singing. It's, it's just mm -hmm. fascinating. Beautiful colors as well. Oh, yeah. And yeah, just the, the way it's all laid out. Um, yeah, and I love the the phrases that are on this. From rock and tempest, fire and foe protect them where, wheresoever they go. And thus evermore shall rise to the glad hymns of praise from land and sea. Wow. Beautifully done. It really is, yeah. Lots of ideas here, Catherine. Love I know, waves. right? I love the waves. Yeah. Yeah, they're stylized beautifully. So that then moves us forward. So to uh, the Korean War. Now, actually, um, we have here Servant of God, um, Emil Kapan. He served two wars. So he was uh, an auxiliary chaplain at the Army Air Base in Harrington, Kansas in 43 and 44. And he was an, entered the Army Chaplain Corps in 44 and then sent to Burma and India for the end of World War II. And wow. he was promoted to the rank of captain in 46. And then he was the chaplain to the anti-aircraft Artillery Corps in Texas in 48. And he was sent to Okahama, Japan in 1950 to help with the post-World War II peacekeeping forces. And from there, um, his regiment was part of the first American troops sent to assist South Korea. Mm. Yeah, he had a, they say he had a reputation for being fearless as a soldier who risked his life to minister to men fighting on the front lines, along with praying with the men in foxholes and saying mass on the battlefields, oftentimes using the hood of his Jeep. This is why we titled this show Mass on yeah. the Hood of a Jeep. Yeah. He's like the poster child for that. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, he also risks his life to administer sacraments to the dying and retrieve wounded soldiers and burying the dead of both ally and enemy alike. Oh, wow. Yeah, so 
fascinating you know how he was just there for his men um I, there is a website um for his cause of canonization and there's beautiful information there real in-depth on his life and his story and it's um at fathercapon.org highly recommend yeah. it to people yeah um, take a look at it yeah, absolutely yeah and then i think even just searching him i came across um a short film that was made about him. If you search on YouTube, I think I'll put the link in the show notes Yeah, where they yeah. did a beautiful story about his life. And especially um, the end of his life, he was um, a prisoner of war for quite some time and how he ministered to the men. Well, was he a prisoner of war? Um, you know? In uh, Korea, North Korea. Okay. I forget exactly where, but yeah, yeah. he suffered quite a bit. Um, while there, but all the time was encouraging his men. Mm. Beautiful. And again, you can see just simplified. He's still wearing beautiful vestments. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah. the way he set up his Jeep, it's, you know, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty basic, but it looks like he's mm -hmm. in rough territory, you know? Yeah. Like it is. Look at his boots. <laughs> yeah. And then jumping ahead to another war in Vietnam. So yeah. this is uh, displayed at the Chaplin Museum. And this is Father Charles J. Waters. And they wrote that he moved among and in front of the troops, aiding the wounded, administering last rites to the dying. While he was giving last rites, a bomb fell, killing 42 U.S. soldiers. One of them was Father Waters. Oh. And he uh, was given the Medal of Honor uh, posthumously in 1969. Wow. So, and you know, this was the first chasuble. time we saw camouflage, right? I know. I was thinking that chasuble is camouflage. And again, um, very basic now. It's interesting how the um, the early traveling altars were in many ways quite basic. And then you mm -hmm. see them kind of becoming more and more elaborate. And then it's interesting to see this in Vietnam. You know, you could see him just bringing out one of that, you know, that ivory. Of course, that was quite um, valuable. But, mm -hmm. you know, the ivory, gold, and wooden... Um, traveling altar that we saw early on you know or even saint cuthbert you know they were not big and mm -hmm. this looks like he just had enough um so it's interesting to see that how they they the sizes change maybe depending on where they are but this camouflage trossable is quite interesting um yeah but again needs must yes yep yep i'm surprised there's not a cause for his canonization but anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here are a couple of interesting ones. So this is kind of um, some examples that you may have not been aware of the fact that you were looking at some traveling altars if you're maybe watching um, an, a show. But uh, this first one is a historically accurate portable altar from the net series the king and i don't know this series because i don't have netflix but i believe <laughs> judging from the haircut <laughs> that would be henry the eighth at angion court and uh -huh. um but apparently this was again a military altar very basic very basic mm -hmm. um so they really haven't changed i i, I just got finished saying oh look at how they were really elaborate and how they've been reduced but you know, the basic elements of them are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then this other one, Catherine. Well, we're going to jump up to good old Father Mulcahy from <laughs> MASH. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. my favorite character in MASH was Father I Mulcahy. I agree. Yeah. He was fabulous. The actor did such a good job. And I had never noticed his traveling field altar until we were doing research for the show and i was like oh my goodness 
There it yeah. is, set up behind yeah. him as he's trying yeah. to take care of a uh, hot lips Houlihan there and <laughs> all of her Frank. woes. <laughs> <laughs> Frank. <laughs> oh, poor Father Mulcahy. The things he had to listen to. No. <laughs> I know. I know. In yeah. the midst of all that. Yeah, we didn't like the. I didn't like no. the cool people. I liked um, Father Mulcahy and... Uh, Radar! Um, no. <laughs> I didn't like Radar. It was, what? Uh, no, it was the guy. You know, I like the one who was the, the, the Boston Brahmin, who was uh, the surgeon anyway. We don't, oh, but yeah. Okay. You, you know anyway, yes, yes, yes. About, right? Charles or something. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Charles. <laughs> yeah. There it is. That's funny. And yeah. then in the center here, this is an actual chaplain kit, but the, and this isn't the original one for this story, but um, there was a chaplain, um, Francis Sampson who had a problem of losing, dropping his kit. <laughs> and oh, he no. had dropped his kit in a river after a combat jump into Normandy and was scrounging around to, like, dig it up out of the river. And it was actually featured, they used that story, in the movie mm -hmm. The Longest Day. And so, yeah, and it's actually kind of funny because after all of this, um, this real life chaplain, after losing his kit again <laughs> and again, <laughs> not only, and also in Korea, um, he actually made general eventually, you know, he loses his kit so often, but he becomes general, but he ended up, um, helping to improve the chaplain kit and especially to make a jumper friendly chaplain kit that would not get lost in the river. There you so, go. Very oh cool. my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And wow. then there's a, uh, a clip that I'll add to the show notes from a movie called battleground in 1949. And it, it's a really neat clip because it shows a Lutheran chaplain you know, talking to his men, getting ready to have a prayer service in the midst of battle, and just beautiful talking points in the way that these chaplains, you know, whether they were Lutheran, Catholic, you know, Orthodox, are meant to take care of everyone that they're put in charge of. And yeah. so he, he kind of talks about that point, how you have to be there for everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Be the good shepherd. And then also, part of the reason why I wanted to do this episode it was not that long ago on a couple different uh, Catholic art websites came across the work of St. Joseph's Apprentice Portable Altars. It's beautiful. This is um, new work that's being done for priests to be able to do home visits for the sick or when they're out traveling on the road. And I believe also they are looking to do a backpack version of this so that when priests are out, um, maybe taking people out on a pilgrimage through the mountains yeah. or something, you know, yeah. take it with them. But this particular design that they have, and they have a lot of different designs on their website, highly recommend taking a look. Maybe there's a priest in your life that you'd want to get a group of friends together for and have a, portable altar made but this one is beautifully done they had someone hand paint um the mass cards that go along with it and then really? also the image of our lady of guadalupe wow. on the front yeah i noticed that it's it, it's really stunning isn't it and it's mm -hmm. viva cristo ray yeah. yeah and you can see the stone right in the middle of you the, can see this yes yeah, yeah. so he actually makes it a point to um either recover stones that have been removed from churches, old churches. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. And use those. Um, and he also has unblessed stones that the priest would then have to have blessed by his bishop to use. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Good job, Catherine. This was really yeah, fascinating. So, yeah, I so loved it. Neat. Yeah. yeah and, that's, that's you know, awesome. the thing is, it was, it's not, we, um, I was having a discussion with my daughter about this. It's like, 
why isn't there, why don't we know more about this? Is it because it's, it's not that it's unusual, but it's just always been in the background. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like, you just don't even think about it. But as I said, going all the way back to the tabernacle, <laughs> traveling around, yeah. it's always been with us. And, yeah. um, and, it, and, and it's still with us. And, and I would like to thank all of the, the, um, the faithful chaplains uh, around the world who, who bring our Lord to, to fighting men and women um, all over the world. Mm-hmm. Yes. May yep. the King of Peace reign. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'd like to thank you for listening to the Secrets of Sacred Art on StarQuest. To find previous episodes of the Secrets of Sacred Art, you can send and to send feedback. Please visit sqpn.com slash sacred art. You can send us comments by email to sacred art at starquest at at okay let's try this again yeah send an email to sacred art at sqpn.com there we go folks <laughs> and you can leave us comments on youtube and then please join us in conversation by visiting our secret of sacred art channel on the star quest discord community um maybe you've seen some of these traveling altars or maybe you're a Navy chaplain or Army chaplain. We would love to hear your story and maybe see pictures of yeah. and if how the any, kits look now. <laughs> yeah, and have, if you have any information about, you know, we saw these pictures, but it was, we just couldn't find the information. We would love if someone has some insight and information about this. That'd be so fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we'll be back next time with a special crossover episode with the secrets of movies and TV where we'll be discussing the 2009 movie, Secret of Kells. Until then, I'm Alex Murray. And I'm Catherine Laffrey, hoping you find something beautiful. Bye-bye.